this to us. And Father, as we seek to instill in this generation a deep trust and abiding faith in you and who you are, we pray that you would use your word to that end even this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. If you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to Judges chapter 3. We'll pick up in verse 7. That should be on page 189 if you need the Bible in front of you. While this is no endorsement of the show, I think I've only seen it a time or two. Uh, I've watched this show called Restaurant Impossible. I think there's a number of varieties of this, but uh, a restaurant is struggling. This guy who has run restaurants in the past comes in as a specialist to help uh, fix it. They have two days. They deal with physical problems. They deal with taste of food. They deal with uh, how it's handled, service, everything, top to bottom. Uh, he's got two days to fix it. It's televised. He does a lot of yelling at people because um, he's not happy with how they're doing things. He tells them exactly how bad it is. Uh, it seems rather unpleasant. Uh, but as someone who has found various ways to lose money through the years, if this is your livelihood and you're at wit's end, you'll take the yelling at. If they can fix you, if they can turn around your business, it's okay to suffer for two days and be told how bad it is if you really want to survive. And I think that idea gives us something of what we should expect here in Judges. God's people are going through things, but with the perspective of eternity, you as God's people would rather go through things now and be saved than be left to your own devices and other failure. We've really spent the first two weeks in Judges on two different parts of the introduction. We saw how partial obedience is such a problem for Israel and how it's going to lead to more and more problems. And we saw the la last week the importance of us owning the covenant God has made, of us taking pride in what God has done and owning it. And this morning we get to our first three Judges. There's 12 Judges in the book. Uh, next week we'll spend a whole week on one, but the way it's structured we'll get three of them this morning. As I read, I want you to note a couple of things. I want you to note the number of years that are covered. We're going to read for approximately three minutes, but we're going to cover a lot of years. I want you to see how many ways the Lord is working, even when God's people are not doing well. <laughs> it's not good times in Israel, but we see God at work. And I want you to see how jealous God's love is. He is jealous for his people. And what kind of love would be indifferent to his people? So with that in mind, if you're willing and able, I would invite you to please stand with me in honor of the reading of God's word. Judges chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asheroth. Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the people of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. So the land had rest forty years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites and went and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of Palms. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, eighteen years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gerah, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. And Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. And he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. 
But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded silence. And all his attendants went out from his presence. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he rose from his seat. And Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly, and the dung came out. Then Ehud went out into the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. When he had gone, the servants came, and when they saw the doors that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, Surely he is relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. And they waited till they were embarrassed. But when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened them. And there lay their Lord dead on the floor. Ehud escaped while they delayed, and he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Sirah. When he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. Then the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. And he said to them, Follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites and did not allow anyone to pass over. And they killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men. Not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. After him was Shamgar, the son of Anath who killed 600 of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also saved Israel. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, as we think about your salvation, as we think about your deliverance of your people, as we think about the story of, not just in Judges, but in all of your revelation, in all of your history, how you're saving a people for yourself so that, as we just sang, a thousand generations may gather and sing, Worthy is the Lamb. Oh God, may we hold fast to your word this morning. May we be quick to cry out ourselves in repentance and faith. And would you teach us from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So much of the time in this broken world in which we live, the favor of God on his people is not apparent. God's people struggle just like people who rebel against God. We have hard seasons, we get hard diagnoses, we lose jobs, we lose loved ones. It's not always obvious that we are God's children. And as we look at Israel here in the book of Judges, we wonder, was God's favor on Israel when they were being ruled by Cushan Rishathaim or by Eglon? And I want to propose to you this morning that unintuitively the answer is yes. I hope to help you see this morning how God's hand can be working even when it looks like all hope is lost. Just like the restaurant impossible person it might not feel good to get yelled at but if the alternative is failure and on a much larger scheme if the alternative as humanity is to never be reconciled to God then yes Lord bring the hard things that it may bring me back to you the summary of the sermon this morning is that because God's saving work is ongoing we can learn to see God's hand at work even when it looks like God has given up So if we know, based on God's word, that his salvation is working, he is is always at work for our good as his people. If we know that, then we can learn to look and to seek to see where his hand is at work, even when it looks like he's not at work at all. I want to use a series of questions, six in fact, to help us to learn to recognize God's hand in his redemptive work. I'm going to focus mainly on the story here with Ehud, and we'll reference Othniel and Shamgar as uh, the same things come up. But Othniel was basically 
just the story of Judges. You plug his name in and some different numbers. I mean, he is the quintessential story in the book of Judges. Ehud, we get a few more details. So I'm going to focus our time there on verses uh, 12 to 30 uh, and reference these others as needed. So first question of the text this morning is, how do we make sense of God's people struggling? Right? It doesn't make sense. They're God's people. Of all the things that we would expect for God's people, it would be blessing. But here God's people are struggling. How do we make sense of it? We'll look at verse 12. And the people of Israel again did what, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. You want to know why they're struggling? It's because they had done evil. God told them to live this way or else these were the consequences. They chose to live another way and now the Lord himself has strengthened the king of the Moabs against his own people. And to drive it home, the author of Judges says it twice. They did evil because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. It's the same situation God's people find themselves in earlier in the days of Othniel. Look back in verse 7 and 8. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and they served the Baals and the Asheroth. Just what God had warned them about. This is what they're doing. Therefore, a real fine point, serve the Baals and the Asheroth. Verse 8, therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the king of Mesopotamia. So we see just very clearly why God's people are struggling. They're struggling because of their rebellion. They're struggling in their sin. God had um, raised up Eglon here in, in Ehud's story, and we see Eglon takes the opportunity, verse 13, he, Eglon, gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites and went and defeated Israel, and they took possession of the city of Palms. Now, the city of Palms most likely is Jericho. You'll remember that's the first country, God, or first city God's people conquered coming into the promised land. And so you've got Moab over here. You've got the Jordan River. And then you've got the city of Palms or Jericho. And so Moab had come over and taken the city of Palms. And so here, uh, Eglon is taking advantage of what the Lord had, had given him the opportunity to do. So he gets with two more of Israel's enemies, and they come in and conquer. How many years? Look at verse 14. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Can you imagine? 18 years under this enemy king. We also see back in verse 8, when the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel there, the people of Israel served Kishon, Rish, Athayim, eight years. So eight years of hard-heartedness, 18 years of hard-heartedness. Christian, when you are tempted to sin, to sin, excuse me, to neglect God, to carve your own path, know that he can outweigh you. When you think, I'm just going to do it my way, know that God can outweigh you. He can wait eight years. He can wait 18 years. He can wait as long as he needs. He can steal your joy. He can hold you back. He can frustrate you as long as it takes so that you, his child, will come back to him. When you're tempted to pursue worldly pleasure, when you're tempted in greed, when you're seeking satisfaction, seeking pleasure outside of God's will, know that whether it's 18 years, 8 years, 4 months, whatever it takes, God can outweigh you. And let that factor in your decision. Know that about your God. He is a God of salvation and he is a patient God. And he'll let you be in your misery as long as he sees fit. Well, how can we make sense of God's people struggling? In this case, the struggle is the beginning of their salvation. Remember the, therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel? God was doing something. In order to save these people from their sins, they had to see their sins. And they're living in their misery. But alas, God is at work saving his people. Let us now see how God's work happens in difficult circumstances second question this morning is, so what is the turning point for God's people? We see it in verse 15. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gerah, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. We have got here God's deliverance. They, in, in this case, they waited 18 years under Moab. I mean, that's a long time. 
Some of us have, in this room haven't been alive 18 years. But they wait 18 years and eventually they cry out. Or in verse 9 above, when they're under the king of Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them, Othniel. The turning point is when God's people cry out. Whether it's 8 years or 18 years. And church, this point is very simple. Let us be quick to cry out to God. When we feel the effects of sin, when we taste the bitter fruit of our choices, when we're in rebellion against the one who loves us and saving us to be with him forever and ever, let us be quick to cry out. There's no reason to do it for eight years or 18 years. Let us turn from our sins. Let us come back to our gracious and merciful God. Well, I think another important question about God's salvation is, do circumstances matter? Do the details matter? And I love a good yes and no answer. So the answer is yes and no. First, I want to show you why sometimes the details don't matter. Look with me in verse 10. Othniel is raised up. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave him Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. Let me tell you, when it says that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, the rest of it doesn't matter. That ship had sailed. Cushan Rishamathim was in trouble because God raised up Othniel. We don't get a lot of details. They're not really relevant. God was with them, and he delivered God's people. Similarly, in verse 31, if you were here for the Shamgar part of the story, this is your moment. After him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also saved Israel. Here we have Shamgar. Now, the interesting thing about Shamgar is it doesn't even appear to be an Israelite name. He seems to be Hurrian. And so here you have this foreigner, seemingly, that God raises up, and of course he uses the ox goad, right? I mean, all great deliverers use the ox goad. The ox goad is something like what it sounds like. It's a, a stick that could be up to eight feet long, six inches in diameter on one end with a spade to clean out the plow, and it comes down to a sharp point at the other to jab the ox to get it to go along. And old Shamgar took the ox goad and took out 600 Philistines, and he saved Israel, a bit of a precursor to the better known Samson. But the point is, we don't know anything else about Shamgar. He seems to be a foreigner, and yet God could save his people in that situation. So in a sense, circumstances don't matter. And in a sense, they do. And that's where I want to focus in here on Ehud's story. Because I've already read to you verse 15, where we find out that Ehud is a left-handed man. And some of you feel pretty honored at this moment. We've got us a lefty in the Bible. We're going to see it actually matters. The details matter. When God knit and formed this left-handed man in his mother's womb, God knew that in time that detail would be important for the salvation of his people. Verse 16, this left-handed man Ehud, he made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, a cubit's about 18 inches, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. So presumably most people back then, just like today, are right-handed. You put the sword on the left side, pull out the sword. No, he's going to go on the right thigh under his coat. As you may recall, that detail matters. So he makes the sword, and he comes in verse 17. And he presented the tribute to Eglon, the king of Moab. Now, Eglon was a very fat man. Now, before we go on, I think some of these details, we've we got to be in the right context to appreciate the details. And we've already seen where we're under, the people of Israel are under Eglon for 18 years. So as we read this story that mocks Eglon and is pretty, you know, uncomfortable, as we read it, we must recognize the people of Israel, there's, this is a celebration. As they, as they recount this story, they are celebrating that this wicked king who had been ruling over them, they've had to take tribute to they got to take tribute from the land of Israel across the Jordan River all the way to Moab to pay this man whatever he demands. And so they're celebrating. So we need to, to appreciate, I think of times when famous American enemies have fallen and the celebration that's taken place in our country. 
And I mean, I'm not saying they've all been righteous and healthy celebrations, but you can imagine the kind of joy when a, a great enemy falls. And so as this story is recounted for us, it is a celebration of, by God's people of God's deliverance from a very wicked man. And a man who, mind you, 18 years. I mean, in the last seven years, a good number of you would have been really unhappy with one present or the other or both. But at least roughly half of our neighbors voted, voted for either of these people. Nobody voted for Moab in that day. He's got four and a half presidential terms and no support. He is hated by all. We're all in agreement. We hate Eglon. And so they go to present the tribute. We find Eglon to be a very fat man, verse 18. And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. So, I mean, all this gold and silver and food and oxen, whatever it was, it took an army of people to bring it all to Ehud. So, I mean, excuse me, to Moab. So Ehud sends them away, verse 19, but he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. So I can only imagine here, I mean, Eglon had the sword, uh, excuse me, Ehud had the sword on him. So obviously he's planning to take action. I don't know if he began to chicken out and then he saw the idols and he said, no, I've got to do it, or if it was all part of his master plan. But he gets to the idols, he sends the rest of the people away, he turns back, and and Eglon buys the story, still in verse 19. And he, Eglon, commanded silence, and all his attendants went out from his presence. Now, this is where you've got to wonder, did they pat him down first? Were they checking out that left leg to see if there was anything strapped down there? This is completely conjecture, but in God's providence, we may find one day perhaps Ehud was the first left-handed man. Maybe that's why it's in the Bible. Either It's clearly part of the story, but maybe that's part of how God saved his people, is no one could have ever guessed that you would strap your, right, your, your sword to your right leg. I don't know. But we see here Ehud gets his one-to-one time with Eglon, verse 20. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof, chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat. Now, I don't know if we should read this literally, like God's judgment is the message, or if Ehud is, is just obviously tricking him to come closer. But either way, it ultimately becomes a message from God. Verse 21, and Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt, that is the part of the sword right in front of your hand. And the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull out the sword out of his belly, and the dung came out. Now, why is this in the Bible? We go back to what I said a few minutes ago. The only explanation I can give is the context, because these people have been under this wicked king for 18 years, and they are enjoying the retelling of this story. They're enjoying all these gory details. They're relevant to a people that have been under his hand. Verse 23, then Ehud went out into the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. So Ehud makes his escape. Then we get this awkward scene with the servants. 24, when he had gone, the servants came and when they saw the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, surely he is relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. So you can hear the scuttlebutt around Israel now as people tell this story. They're really enjoying rehearsing what has has transgressed there in Moab. Verse 25, And they waited till they were embarrassed. But when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took their key and opened them. And there lay their Lord dead on the floor. Ehud escaped while they delayed, and he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Sarah. Friends, I said in a sense the details don't matter. God can raise up Shamgar. God can raise up Othniel. But when it comes to Ehud, God knit him and formed him in his mother's womb. When he started throwing with the wrong hand when he was little, his parents probably looked at him funny. But God's salvation was at work. Let us remember and appreciate God's sovereign hand. Let's remember and appreciate his sovereignty both in the circumstances when we see, oh, God did that whether it's timing, whether it's um, uh, just 
being able to find out something before it's too late. Or above and beyond the circumstances, when we see no path forward, we can still appreciate the sovereignty of God because no path forward is no problem for God. He'll raise up a shamgar in a moment's notice if our God needs to. And so Christian, remain faithful. I don't care how long you've been under Eglon. I don't care how long you've been under some kind of difficult part of your life. In time, God will provide what you need. Or his grace will be sufficient all your days. I do think of, of some of our senior saints that are basically bedridden now. I don't think they're going to be healed in this life. But I know God's grace will be sufficient for them all their days. And so, friend, either way, we hold on to his goodness. We hold on knowing that in his good time, whether it's eight years or 18 years, in his good time, he will deliver for his people. Or his grace will get us to the end, to the ultimate promised land where we don't deal with this anymore. Fourth question, how great is God's salvation? How great is God's salvation? Look with me in verse 27. When he, Ehud, arrived, so he comes back. You know, we're still over here in Moab. He comes back across the river, and he comes back to his people in the hill country of Ephraim. Then the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. And he said to them, follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So again, it's been 18 years. He, said, he may not know at this point about how uh, the people waited outside the room, but he knows that Eglon is dead. He knows their king is gone, so we can take the time to get out from underneath the Moabite people. And the people respond, middle of verse 28. So they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites and did not allow anyone to pass over. So you got Moab, you got the Jordan, you got Jericho. They're over here um, overseeing things in Jericho in this land they've conquered. God's people come down to the Jordan and they block it. They can't get back to their land. And then the scriptures show us how full the salvation is. And they killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men. Not a man escaped. It was a full and thorough salvation after 18 hard years as a consequence of sin. Similarly, back up in verse 10, when the Spirit of the Lord was upon Othniel, and he went out and had war with Cushan Rishathaim, and it says the Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. The same idea, a much simpler story, but God provided a salvation for his people. So Christian, Though it may feel like we are in a battle with 10,000 Moabites, though it may feel like it's really uphill right now, let us remember how full of salvation we are in the midst of. Whether it's an addiction you're battling, whether it's sin you've been working on for four or 40 years, whether it's the brokenness of your family that you can hardly bear any longer, it may feel like 10,000 Moabites. But know that we are in the midst of a full salvation. And whenever we're on the backside of that, be it in this life or in heaven, when we look back, we will know our God provided a full and thorough salvation. In the scheme of eternity, your sin battle, the battle with your body as it may be breaking down, it's nearing the end. I've had this song in my head all week long, and Mercy Me did a ver the same title. It's not Mercy Me. It's a more current song, a couple years old, but it's just almost home. The chorus is almost home. We're almost home. And it's just looking forward to when it's all right. And some days when it's all wrong, all we can do is look forward to when it will all be right. But we can know based on the promises of God and the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, it will be all right. We get a taste of God's salvation here. What is the result of God's salvation? Verse 30. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. Similarly, back up in verse 11, 
the people had rest for 40 years until Othniel died. I, I told you before I read the scripture to just see how quickly we moved. In three minutes, we covered 146 years. Sometimes it may not feel like God is at work. Sometimes it may not feel like he's doing what we think he should do or what we're pleading for him to do. But sometimes God's people have waited 146 years. Sometimes they were in bondage for eight, 18. They were in bondage for 400 at one point. It doesn't nullify God's faithfulness. The call on his people is to persist in faith. And one of the ways we do that is we look at his faithfulness over and over again. I'm still stuck on that song. This will, it just caught me when we sang. With a thousand generations, there's coming a day when we're going to get to sing with all these who've gone before us. And we're going to get to hear stories of God's faithfulness. Stories beyond what was captured here. Because over and over and over again, people are going to be able to tell stories of God's faithfulness. Oh, let us hold on, Christian. Let us persist. Now you may wonder, why doesn't God just give his people perpetual rest? He gives them 40 years here, 80 years there. Well, we see the problem. In the perpetual rest, they sin. They go back just like Adam and Eve. They were in perfect rest. They had to work, but it was utterly fruitful work. Life was great. But they sinned. They turned their eyes away from the Lord. And so, friend, we can know the Lord's kindness We can know it when things are bad, and we can know it when things are easy. They're not going to stay bad forever, and they're not going to stay easy forever. The perpetual rest is coming, but until that time, we must continue in faith. Well, the final question of this text this morning really looks at the Scripture as a whole, and I want to answer the question, how is our new covenant salvation different? Obviously, we don't have a battle with the Moabites. We don't need someone to be stabbed. How is our salvation different from their salvation? Well, our salvation is still from evil, for the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23, we still have this evil problem, and we recognize that evil is in our hearts and in the hearts of those around us. Furthermore, our salvation, just like in Israel, still requires that we cry out. Later on in the book of Romans, Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Later on, Paul says in verse 13, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So we still face this evil. We still must cry out to God. So we agree with judges on those two things. But we have a very different Savior. This Savior was not raised up like Othniel was. This Savior was sent on a mission by God. This Savior was sent on a mission. Unlike Othniel, this Savior never sinned. He lived the perfect life. And unlike Shamgar, our Savior did not use an ox goad. Rather, he himself was beaten. Much like Othniel, the Spirit of God was upon him, but it was in a very different way. In Luke chapter 4, we have here recorded for us Jesus standing at the temple, and he reads from the scroll of Isaiah, and this is how he describes the Spirit of the Lord being upon him. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And after Jesus puts up the scroll, he tells the people in his hearing, today these words are fulfilled in your presence. Unlike Ehud, who escaped out the porch of his deliverance, Jesus did not escape. Someone had to die for the deliverance of God's people, and the deliverer himself laid down his life. The sinless died for the sin fool. And unlike Ehud, there was no reason for Jesus, no need for Jesus to mislead because he has all authority in heaven and on earth. And when Jesus returns, his sword will not come from his right thigh. No The book of Revelation tells us it'll come directly from his mouth. 
hear God's word from Revelation 19, 11 to 16. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This Jesus is not like Othniel. He's not like Ehud. He's not like Shamgar. And he's not offering 40 years of rest. He's not offering 80 years of rest. He is offering rest eternal. So if you're here today and this is not your Jesus, I want to ask you, would you come up under this Savior? Have you accepted his work on the cross of Christ? If you have not accepted his work on your behalf as a sinner before a holy God, you have rejected his work. Do you love his lordship? Are you so glad that he's the Lord of your life and you are not? If not, you have rejected his lordship. Have you turned from your sins and asked him to save you, that you might be with him forever? If you have not, friend, you can do that right where you're at. I'll be happy to meet with you right here, right outside these doors after this service. Do not leave here an enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Accept what he has done on your behalf. In closing, let us remember where we've been in this passage. From the cries of people of God to the rest the people of God experienced. So much of the time in this broken world, the favor of God on his people is not apparent. Because of God's saving work, being ongoing, we can learn to see God's work even when it looks like God has given up. While brokenness abounds, even if Eglon and Kushan Rishathaim appear to be ruling, we know God is still working out our salvation. We may not recognize our Othniel. We may not have a left-handed assassin. Our Savior might not use an ox goad, but he is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Though sin persists, our salvation is secure in the blood of Jesus. Though Restaurant Impossible may turn a business around in two days, Jesus' work in us is ongoing. We can gladly cry out when things are wrong, even as we remember the rest he has secured for us. Father, we praise you this day for so great a salvation. We praise you for a story of salvation where over and over again you have been faithful to your people. And Father, we confess that though you have been so faithful in so many ways, we have not. And so Lord, as we meditate on your word here in Judges, as we remember what Jesus has done on our behalf, as we look forward to his return as described in the book of Revelation. Lord, may we give you everything. May we be a people utterly surrendered to your goodness, to your grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We've come to a time of response. Uh, The musicians are going to play through our final song a time or two. It'll be a time for you to pray and respond to God. You can pray right where you're at. You can find someone in this room, myself included, to pray with. If you've never come to know this Jesus, I'd love to begin that conversation with you. There's no greater joy than knowing that this Jesus has saved you from your sins. But you respond as the Lord leads, and when you're good and ready and the musicians are singing, you feel free to join and stand and sing. Mm-hmm.